Let's move on now to uh, the treatment of chronic uh, myeloid leukemia. The treatment of these patients has clearly changed over the last decade. I like to remind my students though that we have not been able to actually show a survival benefit of a new therapy compared with interferon or another ABLE TKI from randomized trials. Even the IRIS trial shows no difference in overall survival between those who are allocated to interferon and those to an ABLE TKI imatinib because of the crossover. And so I think that's a challenge. However, when we look at retrospective data from places like MD Anderson, clearly these patients are doing much better with having ABLE TKIs um, available. And now we have four commercially available um, drugs, imatinib, nilotinib, dasatinib, and basutinib. As we will talk about in a few minutes, panatinib was recently withdrawn from the market or at least put on uh, hold uh, been pending an FDA uh, audit of uh, some uh, toxicity data. And we have a lot more to say about that. Um, and there's almost a taxing. So we have these agents available for, for our patients. But I'd like to focus the last part of our discussion on really three major topics, okay? And the first is, can we stop ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors? What's the data? Where are we going? The second um, that I'd like to discuss is, what's the most optimal frontline therapy? I think that's a, a hot topic for uh, doctors who are seeing their next newly diagnosed CML patient. And then finally, what do we do for patients who have failed first and second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors? So given the time constraints, I want to really focus on those three things. So let's open it up to discussing uh, the first of those, which I can't remember. Do you remember? Okay, well, <laughs> steam with stopping therapy. It's very stopping therapy. It's very appealing. We live in a world where resources are not unlimited. Uh, we have to treat and stop therapy eventually. Patient will ask me, can I be cured? what cure is, when I'm going to stop therapy. And they forget that CML is still cancer. Uh, for hypertension, for, we prescribe a beta blocker forever, and nobody complain of that. In CML, we need to stop therapy. So we're pressured by the patient, by the society, by the financial world to stop therapy. In that sense, at the ASH meeting, two studies, STEAM-1 and STEAM-2 from France, essentially, where patients who had imatinib therapy and achieved what he called undetectable disease for a median of two years, had to stop the treatment and being monitored on a monthly basis the first year for a possible relapse. 60% did relapse within seven months. Now in the update present, will be presented by uh, Dr. Maho, there was some relapse later on within the two years or three years, although the relapse is at a molecular level. What's presented is these patients when they, re uh, they are rechallenged with the TKI again, they do respond. I want to highlight small series, short follow-up. It's opening the door for trials to stop therapy. However, the message is we should not recommend to doctors in the community to stop therapy outside the clinical trials. Now, the question that comes as well, is there any prediction? Do we know who are the patients in whom we can stop therapy and that is safe? Delphine Rea is presenting the data from France as well, showing that at the time of stopping therapy, they measure the natural killer cells and their function. And in patients with a good level of natural killer cells functional, they did not relapse, while those with a low level and dysfunctional cells, there was, a high, there was molecular relapse. And that opened the door to the immunity, what's going on uh, beyond just TKI therapy, how we're targeting the stem cell and the whole the environment, and that eventually need to be investigated down the road. Right. The question, Ellie, also like, I have patients that ask me now, should I do that? And Outside the clinical trial context, I've not done that. I say maybe we'll be doing this down the road, but uh, uh, at, at this point, I'm, I totally agree with you. I'm not comfortable to offer patients to stop therapy of a protocol, a study. I, I think there are some clinical mo things can help you sometimes. Did the patients achieve a major molecular response from the get going? How long they've been in, in remission? Uh, I think for some reason, I think in the French study, female did better than male. Like, so there are some things that can guide you to who to select to therapy, but I totally agree with you. I think it opens the door for clinical trials. The factor that we reported is having a high ex long exposure, like five years and longer. We know from interferon, if you give 10 years and you can stop therapy, even with a minimal disease, they remain free of, disease, free of treatment, although it doesn't apply interferon and TKI, they are not similar. And then those with a low SOCO score at the beginning, when you treat them and uh, they have uh, five years of treatment, they don't relapse. Still, uh, in France, they do PCR every month. I'm concerned about the monitoring. If I stop therapy here and somebody is at home after six months coming with a blood phase transformation, that will be unforgivable. So it's appealing. 
Uh, it's a great model, financial model, eventually to be investigated. But in 2013, we should not stop therapy outside clinical trials. It, it, perhaps to expand on that a, a little bit, I, I'm mindful of, of both therapy fatigue, you know, and the issue of this being treated now as very much of a chronic malignancy, you know, kind of a chronic disease state. You know, having been old enough in my career to have, have been around preimadinib, and I'm mindful of the tremendous difference of how much better patients felt on imadenib versus the prior therapies with interferon and things of that nature. Now, over time, clearly, there is, is forgetting what that baseline truly was. And, and I do think the, the danger that we see nowadays with so many options is not only the uh, perhaps premature cessation of therapy until we truly understand it better, but also the uh, willingness to jump between these therapies perhaps prematurely. You know, that, that at the first sign of any toxicity, well, since I got four drugs or more at my disposal, you know, oh, you have a little bit of headache? Well, let's jump to another drug. You know, recognizing that, that they all have their niche, they all have their toxicity profile, and many of these things can become better over time. But again, managing this disease uh, is, is, uh, is very much of a chess match, but the stakes are quite high. I mean, clearly what the data does show us that in general, if individuals do end up progressing, they still have really quite a, a difficult natural history. You know, that brings for uh, what you're saying, Ruben, for, I have two things to comment. First is we need clinical trials to eventually cure these patients by stopping the drug. And then, you know, we are like we go TKI, for example, and if they are MRD positive, combine something different with like PEG interferon or hypometing agents or omacetaxin as well uh, and have complete control of the leukemia stem cell and the whole environment and stopping the drug. These trials, unfortunately, in the United States of America are lacking behind for logistical reasons and other reasons. We encourage doctors to refer at these patients for, uh, for such a trial. Uh, this is one. Second, you mentioned side effect, and it is true we see patients coming like within a year receiving four TKIs, and we do forget side effect, and we forget it's cancer. Like, there's no drug that comes with no label of side effect, Tylenol. I mean, we forget like this is not holy water. These are drugs that we uh, we need to accept some threshold of safety concern. We're dealing with cancer. Right. I I completely agree with that, and I think for for the viewing audience, that's an incredibly important message in the management of these patients. Don't bail at the first sign of toxicity. Uh, you really need to try hard to manage these toxicities. All these drugs have. Have, have different toxicities. One quick point though, um, we all said uh, or believe we would not stop an able TKI off of a protocol, but I bet you you've all had the situation of a young woman who wished to become pregnant. Yeah. And what kind of, um, just a couple of you, what kind of counseling would you give uh, the community physician in that situation? Have you stopped a TKI in that situation and how do you do it? If we're using anecdotal evidence, I have almost exactly that scenario in my practice, a woman who uh, was actually diagnosed while she was pregnant, and in that case we actually delayed therapy until actually she had delivered and even breastfed for a few months. But once we started treatment, she again wanted to have another child a couple years down the road. She had achieved a major molecular response, and I was aware of the, the data suggesting that these patients were being taken off these drugs on trial. I still did not recommend it. I said the recommendations are that your disease could come back, and in theory it could be more difficult to control once that happens. However, uh, she decided to stop taking the drug on her own, and we monitored her closely and saw in this particular case that her disease never seemed to come back. And 18 months later, she became pregnant and had a healthy child. And we have not yet resumed therapy in her, but I think she is not a really good case to hold up as an example, because that's not the natural history of what happens in most cases. What I, would, what I would probably recommend in a person who was determined to stop taking the drug is very close monitoring, recommendation that they see a fertility doctor so that there aren't spending three, six, nine, 12 months trying to get pregnant, that we really minimize that time, and then understanding that uh, there are risks associated with that behavior. Rafael, I completely agree. I've had the same situation only a couple of times, same kind of uh, discussions and recommendations. A fertility expert's a great idea so that um, you can try to achieve that conception as quickly as possible and get people back on, on therapy. And I've had the same experience where in the, those two patients, they remain stable even at a, in a complete cytogenetic remission. If a person stops, if a person stops, would they 
automatically just start interferon alpha or would they watch them? I'm gonna you gonna comment bring on that. that. So I was gonna say, I teach my fellows in the clinic that for the board question, that's the answer. <laughs> the answer is, is interferon. The for the board? Because I would fail that question. There is always <laughs> that. In real life, I'm not sure that we always just start, I think, close monitoring. If there is sign of you know disease coming back or relapse, then you start, the, the that will be the treatment of choice, obviously, during the pregnancy. So and For my patients, you wanna stop therapy, you need to make sure she had a good response before starting yes. therapy. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. you cannot have only CCYR and say, I'm doing great. I mean, I wanna have a deep molecular response because if she's going to relapse, the time to relapse will depend on how much disease she has when she stops therapy. So molecular response, deep molecular response, and then as Rafael mentioned, try to conceive immediately. It's not like holding therapy for two years and then I'm conceiving. Now one last issue is for male, no problem. I mean, we've seen a lot of patients, uh, male who their partners did get pregnant and that was not an issue, no not stop therapy if a uh, male, his wife wanna conceive, that should not be a problem. So that's an off-label recommendation. Do we all agree with that? I mean, sure. you know, I, I've had the same experience. I haven't seen anything, um, and I wouldn't expect an able TKI in a man to cause a teratogenic or genetic effect in, a, in the fetus, but all feel comfortable saying that? I haven't had that scenario. Okay. Uh, we, we do need to move on.